movie, movie music, not yeah, movie that not is. That's one to get along with. Yeah, I think it's from some war movie. Yeah, so. Great. Well, wait, thanks, Ed. It's good stuff. Now, uh, welcome on uh, YouTube, I hope, and uh, Facebook too. Let's get going now shortly. Jingle playing there now. Jingle all the way. So I think yeah, I think we got it working earlier. Uh, uh, William did. I know William did work some magic on it to fix the, the video for us. So we do the wish we can with it. So. Now that's coming up this afternoon at four o'clock. Uh, do tune in, please, to Father John, who will be launching a new program. Uh, the book club it'll be a fortnightly one it was intended of course to start last thursday apologies for that father john had to attend to a funeral so that'll be a four o'clock today so great to get that uh, up and running good morning and welcome to radio maria ireland uh, back with you again for our morning chat to kisses today the opportunity to chat and to share some catholic ethical formation in a nice easy going way i hope and atmosphere as well so uh, shout out to everybody on facebook instagram Sorry, Facebook and YouTube and Vimeo is the other place where we're broadcasting, streaming live. Uh, there's kind of funny things going on, I think, on some of the social media channels. Um, I think, I think, uh, it's, it seems as if uh, there's a bit of censorship or a bit of curtailing, I don't know, of some, some videos. I've, I've just heard these things been spoken of. And I do hope we're, we're not victims of that here ourselves. We absolutely have no intention of being in any way um, sort of controversial or seeking to it's simply be a gentle voice of truth is our mission here uh, so if that's the nature of things we have to move with the times or you know uh, seek other avenues or you know we don't worry about these things because th these things come and go anyway there was a time long before and I, in my lifetime your, your lifetime maybe too but none of these things existed at all there are powerful means of communication and uh, only if the truth can be set free, allow, allow it to set us free, uh, is the main thing. I don't let these things trouble me and I hope you don't either. We simply find other means and other ways. And if it's back to the old fashioned way of going out two by two and social distancing and meeting people, we'll do it that way too. The gospel remains valid and the truth remains there for us all. And indeed, through far worse times uh, in the past of persecution, when I simply couldn't show my face if I were a priest, not that long ago here in Ireland and in many other countries too, uh, priests were on the run, they were in hiding, they were... Uh, I finished that book recently on... Um, oh gosh, the name's gone for me now again. It's it was amazing, just didn't finish the book too long ago. Uh, a Jesuit priest... Who, who dressed up as a gentleman as an sort of esquire of the country and passed as it were as an educated well-to-do gentleman and is sponsored by well-to-do catholics in order to hold fast to the faith um, and to quietly evangelize and run retreats um, uh, gerard john uh, john gerard was that his name uh, extraordinary story so simply adapting to the times and he ended up in the Tower of London and escaped from the Tower of London after after torture and everything. Extraordinary story. So we don't allow these things to trouble us too much. We will we'll, uh, carry on our journey of faith and keep preaching the gospel gently to those who are open to hearing it and, and listening. So do please uh, help us along by sharing and encouraging others to be part of the journey too. Now I got my lovely envelope in, in the post there today, show it to the camera, uh, the Divine Mercy Conference, which uh, Aidan and I are going to sit down, uh, which way do I hold this to straighten out? Yeah, this way, <laughs> on the camera. Uh, we'll sit down together and we'll go through the schedule for the Divine Mercy Conference, which is the 19th, 20th and 21st. Um, and the theme for the conference this year, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. And the speakers there are listed, Sister Breach McKenna, Father Hayden Williams, um, uh, Franciscan too, Father Columba Jordan, uh, CFR Franciscan Friars, Father Brendan Walsh is a, a favourite too, and uh, Dr. Eulin, Reverend Dr. Eulin MacDonald, uh, Salesian Provincial, Salesians, 
following forth in the footsteps of the late Father Michael Ross there. Uh, I'll, buy, I'll be doing my little piece too, of course, for um, the examination of conscience uh, element of it on the Saturday, I think it is. Uh, Aoife Pedreshi uh, is a nurse. Christy May, extraordinary testimony. Christy, I know Christy well. Uh, his conversion testimony from a life of addiction to drugs. Um, extraordinary man. So very interesting. Um, the conference is available free of charge at www.divinemercyconference.com and you'll be able to watch it there. They'll be streaming it too. And we'll certainly be broadcasting it uh, as well on Radio Maria. Um, not, not all of it at the time. We'll simply be weaving in and out, but we'll certainly uh, take as much up as we can to our uh, radio feed as well. So well done to uh, Deacon Don and to um, Father Eunan MacDonald as well for getting that organized. So uh, Don will be with us anyway this afternoon for the Divine Mercy Hour between uh, 3 and 4. He'll probably give it a big shout out and a big plug. So we have the schedule here. It came in the post. Obviously, he's up, up to his um, uh, his eyes there in getting things organized and sending it all, all things out. Of course, he has his booklet with the prayers in it as well. So if you're not listed with Don as part of his, um, you know, on his database and so on, maybe get in touch with him. There's lots of lovely prayers and it's a nice little prayer book. It's quite densely packed here as well. Uh, and lots of nice images. That's the easier booklet and lots of interesting material in there too. Uh, so get in touch with Don. Let me shout out the website for you there. Um, it's got to be divine. Yeah, just simply divinemercyconference.com. Uh, and, and check it out there. I see the second, uh, yeah, just divinemercyconference.com. Maybe you'll find it all there. Uh, so that'll be uh, starting Friday evening, 6 o'clock through to 9 o'clock Holy Mass uh, on the Friday. Saturday from 10 in the morning until uh, the 8.45 at night. And he's beginning with morning prayer of the church and night prayer of the church. Uh, we already have those on, on Radio Maria, for instance. So there are elements of it there we won't need to necessarily rebroadcast or that. But we'll certainly do our best. If we can't do them live, we'll have the talks available for you and we'll make them. Uh, we'll, we'll include them on our schedule and we'll make them available as podcasts too. So don't worry, we won't, we'll miss out anything. Uh, not that you'll miss out on. So do keep an ear out as well. Uh, come to Please God starting next Monday is the 15th. Am I right? Thursday, Thursday 11, 12, something like that. Monday. And at 8 a.m. in the morning is the plan. Just chatting with Aidan there. We'll start our 33-day preparation of consecration to St. Joseph. And I'm going to be using this book here. I have it kind of filled with markers and things. Oops. Um, the Consecration of St. Joseph, The Wonders of Our Spiritual Father by Donald Calloway. Nice little cover on that too. And I'll be sharing with you uh, his little introduction to the 33 days. And then for my own part, I, I won't use the other part of his book. I might dip into it actually um, for some of the days, but I've picked out some lovely documents that I'm going to share with you. One, uh, Pope Francis's own pastoral letter, um, apostolic letter in fact, Patris Cordae it's called. Uh, meaning with the, the, the heart of the Father, cordia or cardium, you know, car cardiac is the heart, cordae. So the heart of the Father. Um, on the 150th anniversary of the proclamation of St. Joseph as patron of the Universal Church. And it's a lovely document, so Pope Francis-esque. It has that, you know, it's easy to read. It's not, it doesn't bog you down or get you into depth. Uh, Pope St. John Paul II you'll be getting to deep water with his writings quickly enough. Um, this is just really nice. And there was a nice passage uh, because I, what I'm doing is I'm reading this and we're going to make the little moment for the act of consecration preparation, maybe 10, 12 minutes or so uh, each day is the plan with a nice little bit of music too. And I'm just taking a segment of this document together with the little five minute daily thought from uh, Callaway. Uh, and that'll be just part of the uh, 12 or 15 minute slot for each day at 8 o'clock from the 15th through to the celebration of St. Joseph on the 19th of March. And uh, my head never remembers that it's St. Joseph the Worker. That's the 1st of May, so it must be St. Joseph, Father of the Church. Um, it's the Solemnity of St. Joseph is what, what it tells me. Let me just check on the 19th. I'm sure there's another uh, title to that or more formal title. I just don't have it in my head. 
and I'm losing the plot of channel. My, my head is just too full these days. That's more like it. St. Joseph, husband of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There you are. The solemnity, in fact, it is. Uh, so that means it's uh, a full mass with the Gloria and the Creed that day. It's not a holy day of obligation, but very, very important. Two days after St. Patrick's Day, too, of course, which is also a solemnity in the church. Somebody had suggested doing a, a consecration of St. Patrick, but I said, mm, we better hold off. <laughs> Go easy on us. Uh, we do St. Joseph this year, being the year that it is, sort of thing. And we will, of course, do the consecration to our day, the 25th of March, minus 33 days within the end of February, but that will begin. And our plan, just going forward, is to have the consecration of St. Joseph at 8 a.m. each day, and that to Our Lady after the Rosary for Ireland, uh, which will change, of course, on the first Friday, because that's a, a more as a, an, upper, an hour of prayer with Patrick and Crystal. We'll figure that out uh, as we go on. At any rate, we'll have the two uh, of them for a time running concurrently, as it were. And what we'll do, we'll just make them available as podcasts too, so that you can uh, follow it if those times of the day don't, don't suit you. But now there's just a lovely piece that I want to share. Where is it from? Patris Corley. And Pope Francis just has this sort of knack um, the way he can uh, allow ideas to resonate. Um, so let me see. It's just a really nice piece that I'm going to share with you. I've, I've prepared it um, for the, the consecration too. It's not, It's the second paragraph of Patris Corley where Pope Francis is speaking about St. Joseph, a tender and loving father. Uh, and in Joseph, Jesus saw the tender love of God. That's what Pope Francis picks up on, the tender love of God that uh, we know from Scripture. Jesus grew daily in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor uh, in those hidden years. So in St. Joseph, then, th this is where Jesus in his humanity learned of fatherhood. Uh, so Joseph did with Jesus uh, what the Lord had done with Israel. Interesting, you know, echoing back to the Old Testament. Israel, of course, Jacob um, was given that new name, Israel. He taught him to walk, take him by the hand. He was for him like a father who raises an infant to his cheeks. Now we had at uh, the prophet Isaiah this morning the maternal imagery for us nursing the child the baby at the breast here the father raising the infant to his cheeks they're two just lovely images for us um, bending down to him and feeding him so th this idea now the pope just you know hold, hold to that lovely idea the tenderness tender love of god and uh, Yes, just I'll, I'll skip that little bit there. Okay, I'm going to share it with you anyway as part of the consecration. So that uh, the whole history of salvation in the Old Testament is, is echoed in that tenderness of God for his children. So uh, all too often, uh, wait, no, let me see, hang on, I'm going yeah, to the beginning here. The history of salvation is worked out in hope against hope, it's from the letter to the Romans, through our weaknesses. Now this is this is what the Pope is, and this is the bit I want to emphasize, uh, where the tender love of God comes in, that through our weaknesses and the story of the Old Testament is replete with the weaknesses even of the chosen people of God. Now here's some very personal advice from you, Pope, Pope Francis. All too often, we think that God works only through our better parts. Not a great translation there. I think what this meant sort of is our stronger moments or the parts where we shine best. Hard to translate that well, I'd say. Yet most of God's plans are realized in and despite our frailty. Now, St. Joseph, you see, uh, again, in his frailty, being a man of honor, thinking, you know, how can I be worthy of this task being given to him? So this is why St. Paul says, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. And three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, 
For power is made perfect in weakness. Again, Our Lady's words of raising up the lowly. So the Pope is, is capitalizing on this way that God works through weakness and frailty, through the lowly, through the, the what the world would think contemptible, let's say. Since this is part of the economy of salvation, we must learn to look upon our weaknesses with tender mercy. And that just jumped off the page of me there when I was working on this last night. We, we must learn to look upon our weaknesses with tender mercy. Somebody asked me, and I, I brought it up before, um, you know, when we're not, it's all well and good to receive mercy, receive forgiveness, but how do we begin to forgive ourselves? And here's a lovely answer. It, it's it's the part of the economy of salvation, meaning the, the working out of salvation. God works with the weak and the frail and the vulnerable and the poor and the lowly. And so w with God, then, we learn to look upon our weaknesses, our lowliness, with tender mercy. That, that's how we begin to forgive ourselves as well as receive God's mercy. The evil one makes us see and condemn our frailty. So I've had that experience. I don't know about you. Maybe you might like to share a thought or two with me on that. Um, you know, we get fed up and, and bogged down and we think, here I go again. And why can't I do what's right? And that, the, that that's a temptation from the devil. We, we, we see our frailty and our weakness and our inability and our incapacity and are going back to the same old things. Um, and, and we condemn ourselves. You know, we beat ourselves up <laughs> with that. And here's what the Pope says. Tenderness is the best way to touch the frailty within us. So it's not about beating ourselves with a stick or having others beat us with a stick either. It's that tenderness. And I come back to that lovely scene in the Gospel of the woman taken in adultery. The Lord is very tender and kind to the woman as I think he's equally kind-hearted towards the men with their stones. Tenderness is the best way to touch the frailty within us. Pointing fingers and judging others are frequently signs of an inability to accept our own weakness, our own frailty. <coughs> you know, that, that's a great thought too. When we're quick to accuse others, we're slow to excuse ourselves. It's it's um, or maybe that's the wrong way around. Um, it, it's an indication, at any rate, when we're accusing others, that we we're, we haven't the we're struggling with the ability to accept our own weaknesses. It's a sign of anger, you know, passive aggression, if you want to call it that. That we we and the it's a great thought too that the faults that I easily find in others are the very ones that I'm guilty of myself. That, that's well worth reflecting on. If I'm quick to find these faults with others, is that me? Is this projection is what they call it too. Only tender love will save us from the snares of the accuser. It's a very subtle snare of the accuser. You know, he makes us see and condemn our frailty. And only that tender love of the father, Joseph, holding the child Jesus to his cheek, of the mother, the baby at the breast. And I have lovely, lovely images again. This tender love it demands that tenderness. Not It can't be done in any uh, aggressive way. It can't be done in a grasping way. The child must realize its need of its mother's milk. Um, the child must, must know the warmth of the embrace of the father. So that is why the Pope says it's so important to encounter God's mercy, especially in the sacrament of reconciliation, where we experience his truth and tenderness. Speaking about this on Tuesday, you know, in the chat and do listen back, they repeat on a Friday at 10 and Sunday too. Um, and it's really all about confession, but we're examining our conscience and looking at really difficult areas. And in relation to the Sixth Commandment, the topic we've been on the last number of weeks, we've come to is that of uh, sins against our sexuality where we're most vulnerable and most weak and where we need to experience again the tender mercy of God in confession without um, the shame and the guilt yes we can be ashamed yes we can feel guilty 
but there again tender mercy. Paradoxically, the evil one can also speak the truth to us, yet he does so only to condemn us. It's interesting how the Pope, you know, tries to expose the work of the devil. We know that God's truth does not condemn, but instead welcomes, embraces, sustains, and forgives us. That truth always present itself to us like the merciful Father in Jesus' parable. It comes out to meet us, restores our dignity, sets us back on our feet and rejoices for us. For, as the Father says, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So a lovely little excursion by Pope Francis there in his document on St. Joseph Patris Corde into the question of mercy. So even though Joseph, St. Joseph fears uh, God's will, his history and his plan were still at work. So Joseph then teaches us that faith in God includes believing that he can work even through our, free, our fears, our frailties and our weaknesses. What a great lesson that is, so simple and so profound. Even in my fears, even in my frailties, even in my weaknesses, God's grace can operate and function and work, and works at its best uh, in, in that docility and humility I'm able to express and live. And so, again, this is why through suffering, indeed, there's tremendous spiritual growth and great grace to be had. Uh, which means that no suffering is meaningless, none. All can be channeled to the good and directed to the goodness of God and the power of God. Joseph also teaches us that amid the tempests of life, we must never be afraid to let the Lord steer our course. At times, we want to be in complete control, yet God always sees the bigger picture. Again, that's the lesson from St. Joseph too. You know, that uh, we like to have control. It's one of the C's, isn't it? Uh, we like to have control. Father John has a number of C's that he uses to preach. <laughs> we have to let go of comfort and control. What were the other C's? I've forgotten them now. He's good at those, those little ways of remembering. Of course, I don't. <laughs> They're different, different brain. Um, comfort, control. I'll, I'll, they'll come back to me, I'm sure. But so... This is what St. Joseph teaches us, our faith teaches us at times. And, and as Father Billy was chatting about yesterday, his own sickness taught him too. That time he got a little TIA. You know, the control was, I had to, I had to let go of the fragility then of our nature. But how God brought great fruit out of that as well. And in the case of St. Joseph, and in our case too. So if it is that we are beset with weakness, we find it difficult to forgive ourselves. There's a path towards self-forgiveness tender mercy of God the tenderness can reach in there and St. Joseph reflects that for us as indeed our blessed lady you know, uh, our lady of Lourdes it's such, I mean if going to Lourdes and I'm sure many of you have been if you want to see tenderness in action it's right there it's written all over the faces of the volunteers it's written all over the faces of the sick and in that there's, there's healing in that even if it's not a physical miracle or a sudden recovery of, of you know, of health, in, in it's the, there's grace can flow and, and can reach us through that tenderness, the tender loving heart of our God who visits us like the dawn from on high. So Pope Francis, he, you know, he's a great way of just getting to the, to the middle of things, to the heart of things very much. I'm going to pause for a little piece of music. I had a CD uh, sent in to me there. I have it in the show on the camera. Uh, I Am The Way, it's called. And uh, Breach O'Sullivan is the singer. All self-composed. And uh, I'm sure she's playing the keyboard on this herself. Uh, this is a bit like um, uh, the, the music I was sent in yesterday. Patrick Fox was in touch too. Uh, and we, I enjoy it. I love it when people do send in their music and share it with us. So I'm going to share one of these tracks with us. Uh, it's called Mary. And just a shout out to John and Mary O'Rahilly, who are, I think, friends of Breach, and they very kindly sent it in to us. Uh, so we're very grateful. John has a, a favourite track from his If I Had My Life to Live Over Again. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting uh, track, too. I'm sure it's giving me a thought 
what would I do? How would I use God for this? So thanks to John and Mary for sending that in to us. Uh, do please get in touch with us as part of the show. 089-467-2000 is the text and WhatsApp number. Give a call to the studio as well. 014-123-456. And if you're in the north or outside of Ireland, plus 353-4123-456. Plus 353-89-467-2000 for the text and WhatsApp. Again, info at radionia.ie to send an email. And do please write to us, St. Anthony's Business Park in Ballymont Road, Dublin 22. Lovely post coming into us again this morning. So thanks, Aidan. He's going to share this piece of music with us now. It's called Mary from the CD I Am The Way by Breach O'Sullivan. Thanks, Ed. No, it's water, I guarantee you, on the camera. No, sorry, it could be sorry. We're, <laughs> not, we're not live, but it'll be put up later on the show. Was it not live on? No, no. Oh, that's a shame. Mm. Oh, well, talking to myself. Happy birthday, 117. Oh, yes, yeah. Perfect chat, thank you. Well, there you go. Do join us, uh, help us to today for the encounter program. Uh, Sarah will be on live. There'll be a guest from Net Ministries coming on. I think Paul Rick is uh, the person now. I might be mistaken there. I'm well prone to making lots of mistakes. So that happens too today as well. So do join in for that as too. Uh, thanks, Susan, for listening in this morning. Uh, thanks uh, for sharing with us. I think Michael is in Bantry. I think is enjoying the show too as well. Uh, thanks, Brian. Brian says for a great example of the tenderness uh, that can be seen in this Sunday's Gospel. Jesus showing tender mercy to the leper who would have received only cries of unclean and exclusion. 
Jesus doesn't flinch as the leper approaches, but reaches out his hand to touch him with tender mercy, and in doing so cures him. What a great example for all of us sinners to never be afraid of approaching God, seeking mercy and healing. And that's fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Yes, it is Podrick uh, this afternoon. I have this too. So thanks, Brian. Indeed, this it's a lovely theme, isn't it? The tender love and mercy of the Lord and Pope Francis. Just to bring it into the story of St. Joseph for us. And very appropriate uh, today as well. Uh, so many thanks indeed uh, for all your lovely messages here coming into us. Um, let me see. Uh, hey, just clicking through and catching up. So great. Thanks, Amelia. A nice little story here. And actually, uh, just thanks again to um, our friends John and Mary O'Reilly and uh, Intrally sending in the CD on the way. As we just saw them, a little bit of the next track uh, for good measure put in there as well. But so thanks indeed for kind of getting in touch with us and thanks for being part of uh, Radio Maria in that way. Uh, I don't think we're streaming live, Aidan tells me at the moment. We're recording it. We can post it up later online for those who might want to have a look. Uh, nice piece of news here now as well. And I heard about this already. There's a, a French religious sister who today is 117 years of age. Can you believe that? Uh, she's the second uh, oldest person in the world. I think there's a, a man, I think it's a man in Japan who's 118. He's the oldest. Uh, so she's Europe's oldest person. Sister Andre uh, has survived the virus. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. And she'll celebrate her 117th birthday today. Uh, Lucille Randon who took the name of Sister Andre? She's uh, going to be a French accent for you there. Uh, when she joined uh, a Catholic charitable order in 1944, uh, let me do some maths here. So that's 56 plus 21 is 77 years <laughs> a religious. She tested positive for the coronavirus in her retirement home in Toulon, in southern France, on the 16th of January. Now that must have been a scary moment in a way. Uh, she was isolated from other residents, but displayed no symptoms. Asked if she was scared to have COVID-19, Sister Andre told French television, No, I wasn't scared because I'm not afraid to die. I'm happy to be with you, but I would wish to be somewhere else, to join my older brother and my grandfather and grandmother. I think um, I think she was orphaned. I wonder whether the war had that effect on her family, God bless her, and that her brother was very uh, responsible for bringing her up. I think it was when she'd been born. That's a uh, 117, so four, 1904. Gosh, that's from the First World War, then not the Second World War. <laughs> oh, it's just extraordinary when you throw your mind back. Um, so she's doing well. The uh, spokesman from the nursing home said, We consider her to be cured. She is very calm and she is looking forward to celebrating her 117th birthday today. Uh, she's blind, uh, but very spirited. In fact, uh, I saw on one of the news feeds there a video of her. They've interviewed her and she has wearing her veil and she looks all the part of the sister, but um, in a wheelchair there, but un un unable to see. Um, but recalling uh, episodes in her own lifetime, uh, that have remained with her of, of mercy again actually I think so as I was watching that video it's in French um, so she'll celebrate her birthday with a smaller group of residents than usual because of the virus she's been very lucky he added uh, blessed we would say <laughs> Sister Andre was born on the 11th of February uh, actually yeah just refer to me there I'll say it's a piece of what a great day to be born 1904 the world's second oldest living person, as is known, uh, as far as it can be known. That is jaw-dropping, you know. Uh, she has survived the coronavirus. Go figure. Go figure. You know, put that in the news. <laughs> well, it is in the news. I think it was on the news, actually, uh, nationally, I think. Uh, wonderful to hear. Now, can I share with you some of the Pope's message for World Day of the Sick for this year? Because... Uh, it is a lovely moment in uh, the year. And of course, our great love in Ireland that we have for Lady of Doors. Join myself and Morgan actually at one o'clock. Morgan will be leading a conversation in relation to those and we'll be inviting some guests on 
to share their stories as well. The celebration of the, excuse me, 29th World Day of the Sick, um, the Liturgical Memorial of Our Lady of Lourdes, is an opportunity to devote special attention to the sick and to those who provide them with assistance and, and care, both in healthcare institutions and within families and communities. We think in particular of those who have suffered and continue to suffer the effects of the pandemic. To all, and especially to the poor and the marginalised, I express my spiritual closeness and assure them of the Church's loving concern. And the words are from the Pope. The theme is drawn from the Gospel passage in which Jesus criticises the hypocrisy of those who fail to practice what they preach. And the theme is, you have but one teacher and you are all brothers. A trust-based relationship to guide care for the sick. When our faith is reduced to empty words, unconcerned with the lives and needs of others, the creed we profess proves inconsistent with the life we lead. Great uh, challenging statement there. The danger is real. That is why Jesus uses strong language about the peril of falling into self-idolatry. You have but one teacher, you are all brothers and sisters. Um, and the cult of the self is quite important today. The body beautiful, the, the, you know, the, the well-built, well-formed, well-tanned, well-heeled, well-fed <laughs> uh, magazine cover version of, of untruth. It's so far from reality, the rare, rare number of people who possess those proportions or, or that much health. It's simply not the case. It just isn't. Look around. Don't look very far. So we have no reason to be indulging our fantasy and our imagination with uh, photoshopped images of ourselves. Uh, so Jesus' criticism of those who preach but do not practice is helpful always and everywhere since none of us is immune to the grave evil of hypocrisy, which present, prevents us from flourishing as children of the one Father called to live universal fraternity. Yes, we can all do with looking in the mirror, we really can, of our hearts, I might suggest, <laughs> rather than uh, uh, appearances on the outside. Before the needs of our brothers and sisters, Jesus asks us to respond in a way completely contrary to such hypocrisy. He asks us to stop and listen, to establish a direct and personal relationship with others, to feel empathy and compassion, and to let their suffering become our own as we seek to serve them. That's a challenge, and it's difficult to do uh, when, when we're um, you know, seeking to do that. We, our, our time and energy will, will be demanded of us, those who are dependent on us, who are in need of the work is endless work to be done in caring for, for the poor and the suffering and there aren't enough hours in the day to be able to do it all um, what's that expression that one soul is diocese enough for a bishop <laughs> uh, so again one person one sick or suffering person uh, and yeah, are, are there not wonderful spouses who do that spend a lifetime caring for someone who's suffering and in the the self-giving that accompanies that uh, there, there's tremendous growth uh, if that's love when it's worse in sickness and um, for better for worse rich for poorer uh, that's the challenge the experience of sickness the Pope goes on the Pope goes on makes us realize our own vulnerability and our innate need of others it makes us feel all the more clearly that we are creatures dependent on God. When we are ill, fear and even bewilderment can grip our minds and hearts. We find ourselves powerless since our health does not depend on our abilities or life's incessant worries. It does, it does incapacitate us and, and weakens us, certainly. Sickness raises the question of life's meaning which we bring before God in faith. 
in seeking a new and deeper direction in our lives, we might not find an immediate answer, nor are our relatives and friends always able to help us in this demanding quest. Job is the figure he, he mentions. He's emblematic in this regard. And Job's wife and friends do not accompany him in his misfortune. True, you have to read the book of Job. Instead, they blame him and only aggravate his solitude and his distress. He's not getting a whole lot of help from those he probably should have rightly expected a help from. Job feels forlorn and misunderstood. Yet for all his extreme frailty, he rejects hypocrisy and chooses the path of honesty towards God and others. He cries out to God so insistently that God finally answers him and allows him to glimpse a new horizon. He confirms that Job's suffering is not a punishment or a state of separation from God, much less as a sign of God's indifference. Job's heart wounded and healed then makes this vibrant and touching confession to the Lord. I had, I had heard of you by word of mouth, but now my eye has seen you. Isn't that interesting? That he, his journey of faith went from the head, if you like, to the heart through suffering. Now he, he, he had known God and had been faithful to God in his own way. But now he understands this all the more clearly and the more deeply as a result of his suffering. Sickness always has more than one face, the Pope goes on. It has the face of all the sick, but also those who feel ignored, excluded, and prey to social injustices that deny their fundamental rights. Now the Pope is referring, of course, to the doctrine of fratelli tutti, that we are all brothers and, and sisters. The current pandemic has, has exacerbated inequalities in our healthcare systems and exposed inefficiencies in the care of the sick. Elderly, weak and vulnerable, pe vulnerable people are not always granted access to care or in an equitable manner. I hope that's not the case here in, in Ireland. Maybe I'm, I'm not hearing of, of um, such cases making it certainly to the public eye as much. But no doubt it's true. I mean, there, there are those who will, who will rally loudly against our own healthcare system and see uh, great need to improve it. Um, and these cases do certainly exist. I mean, I'm aware of it. I'm not so glossing over it by any means. I'm aware of in inequitable treatment that takes place. Rightly or wrongly, again, is it human nature or human error? Is it where, where again, Let's not go down that road of, of blaming or laying fault. Let's work towards it uh, instead. He said this is a result of political decisions, or resource management, and greater or lesser commitment on the part of those holding positions of responsibility. A very general way of understanding it, yes. Investing resources in the care and assistance of the sick is a priority linked to the fundamental principle that health is a primary common good. So if ever our political leaders had a task in hand, the th one of the first ones surely should be our, our health care system. Yet the pandemic has also highlighted the dedication and generosity of health care personnel. These people are the frontline workers, uh, volunteers and support staff, priests and men and women religious, all who have helped, treated, comforted and comforted and served so many of the sick and their families with professionalism, self-giving, responsibility and love of neighbour. A silent multitude of men and women, they chose not to look the other way, but to share the suffering of patients whom they saw as neighbours and members of a one human family. That's lovely. That's the absolute, hugely positive plus side of the pandemic we've been going through. And we acknowledge that and we, we thank indeed all our dear frontline workers. Um, so many. You know, risking themselves, too, risking their own health. Such closeness is a precious balm that provides support and consolation to the sick in their suffering. As Christians, we experience that closeness as a sign of the love of Jesus Christ. 
the good Samaritan who draws near with compassion to everyone wounded by sin because that's the greater affliction physical suffering is tragic and, and deeply concerning but spiritual suffering is such great need for healing there too united to Christ by the working of the Holy Spirit we are called to be merciful like the Father there's that expression again did you hear, remember hearing that a while ago <laughs> and to love in particular our frail infirm and suffering brothers and sisters we experience this closeness not only as individuals but as a community indeed fraternal love in christ generates a community of healing a community that leaves no one behind a community that is inclusive and welcoming especially to those most in need i'm leaning to 117 year old religious sister fairies too <laughs> extraordinary uh, I don't have time, unfortunately, to, to go through uh, the rest of this here. But uh, let's just conclude with, with some of the thoughts that are here. So he's talking about the encounter with Christ, the interpersonal relationship with Christ. Um, and the necessity for that to safeguard the professionalism of health cares and foster good relationships too with families, with patients. So, dear brothers and sisters, he concludes, the commandment of love that Jesus left to his disciples is also kept in our relationship with the sick. A society is all the more human to the degree that it cares effectively for its most frail and suffering members in a spirit of fraternal love. Let us strive to achieve this goal so that no one may feel alone, excluded or abandoned. Yeah, it's the test of a good society, the measure in which we care for the sick. And I know there's exceptional care for the sick here in Ireland. To Mary, Mother of Mercy, and the health of the infirm, I entrust the sick, health care workers, and all those who generously assist our suffering brothers and sisters from the Grotto of Lourdes and her many other shrines throughout the world. May she sustain our faith and hope and help us care for one another with fraternal love. And to each and all, I cordially impart my blessing. Now, a lovely message there. Just I, I didn't get through all of it there, but for Pope France, from Pope Francis for the 29th World Day of the Sick. So indeed, uh, here on Radio Maria, we, our hearts and our prayers, accompany you in all your needs, physical, uh, mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual too. And we seek to be a friend, a companionship, a gentle voice of prayer, of support, of fellowship, and to bring that healing that Christ brings through our Blessed Lady. That's our task and our role here, because the light of the Gospel brings light, healing and comfort into our, our eyes and our hearts, and allows us to unite our sufferings with those of the Lord, and in that too comes a certain healing of spirit. So we've been greatly blessed and uh, thank you indeed for being part of the radio here. Thank you for accompanying me today on the Chattachesis Hour. It's now 12 o'clock. We'll have a pause for our Angelus and Midday Prayer. See you later. <laughs>